Hello everyone and welcome to the Disruptive Innovation Festival 2014. My name is Joe Isles and I'll be your host for the next hour. As you know by now a key part of the DIFF is our headline acts. These are globally recognized individuals providing an insight into the key disciplines for building the future economy. And we all but know by now that materials and natural resources are an important part of any economy and a future circular economy would involve technical and biological materials in cycles rather than the take, make and dispose practices that we use today. So how can we design and build things that can be made to be made again? Well, to help us out, help us find out, today we'll be hearing from Mark Miodovnik, the director of the Institute of Making, who's joining us from the Institute in this hangout from London. Later on in the session, we'll also find out from Mark what his all-time favorite material is. But before we, we hear from Mark, just a few things I'd like to mention. This is a Q&A session. We really want it to be interactive, so it's your chance to ask Mark anything you like, from materials and stuff to education and the wider economy. And there's a few ways that you can get in touch. If you haven't done this already, you can click the prompt inside the viewing window of the Google Hangout to be part of the conversation. You can then use the Q&A app to ask your questions for Mark. Alternatively, you can ask your questions on Twitter using the hashtag thinkdif, that's thinkdif. But now onto the main event. Mark Miodovnik is Professor of Materials and Society and Director of the Institute of Making at the University College London. He's an engineer, a material scientist, or as Mark puts it himself, he's a materials enthusiast. And last week, the Institute of Making launched its new digital materials library app. It's an online, globally accessible version of the physical collection that's held at the Institute of Making. The app is available to download now for free uh, from the App Store. And the collection holds some of the most wondrous materials gathered from sheds, labs, grottos, and repos repositories around the world. It's the first time information about the materials in the library and their relevance will be made available to a global audience. I recommend you go and download it now. So, hello, Mark. Good to have you with us today. Yeah, it's very nice to be here. Thank you. Um, I'd really like to hear some more about the materials library a little bit later on. But first, there are some viewers out there who won't be familiar, perhaps, with the Institute of Making. Um, so could you start by taking a few minutes just to explain what the Institute of Making is, how it came about, and precisely what it, what it aims to achieve? Yes. OK, so um, if I start at the beginning, I, I am a material scientist. So my day job is um, designing, making, engineering new materials. And um, I'm lucky. I'm, I get to do the things I love. And um, that requires a lot of kind of um, attention to the theory, the things like quantum mechanics and chemistry, bonding, molecules, all this sort of stuff, crystals, how they behave, how they bond together, what gives you strength. But also, um, as I was sort of starting out in my career, I guess going back now <laughs> about 15 years, I found myself in labs um, where those were the only concerns, that whether something was strong or whether something had uh, the right electrical conductivity. And I became increasingly disturbed that there was sort of a very narrow view of what materials were that I was engaged in and thousands of people like me engaged in. And if you talk to people outside our world, they had another view of what materials were, which was this stuff, you know, how something feels, their clothes, the architecture, the room, the objects, teacups, bottles, <laughs> you know, this stuff for them was what materials was about. And they would, if you ask them about the things they were concerned, it could, it could be that there's a new material in fashion or there was, you know, shape memory alloy being used in a pair of glasses, but it was totally divorced from what I was doing. And uh, I thought, well, this is odd, you know, because actually the, all of the kind of the science around these materials is is not really engaging with quite a lot of the social, cultural design issues. Um, and I looked around to see if anyone was doing anything about this. If any, <laughs> and what I saw was a, 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 a two sets of people interested in materials. There were the people in the materials arts institutions, like art colleges, design colleges, architecture schools, and they had their own their view on materials. And then there was the material scientists and engineers, and we had our view of materials. And there was just this enormous gap down the middle. So I, I thought, well, I, I really would like to do something about that. It sort of disturbed me. And I, and also I just, you know, as a materials enthusiast, I felt like actually there's a great opportunity here because 
quite a lot of the techniques that we use in material science I felt could be useful in the materials arts and I give an example as this which is I was working for companies like uh, you know Rolls Royce um, and you know I did my PhD on designing jet engine alloys and those companies invest in the long term on materials research they invest 10 20 years ahead they they're constantly looking at the big picture where they where their companies going what materials they need to look at um, when I talked to architects and I talked to designers, I found that those companies weren't doing that. What they were doing is relying on materials to arrive in the marketplace fully formed that they could then use. And it felt to me like that was an odd way for big companies, innovative, so-called innovative companies to work. Um, and there are exceptions, of course. Apple is a very good exception of how they had searched out particular materials, technologies they knew they needed in order to get to the devices they knew people wanted. And they, 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 they in a sense, an exception to that rule and, and probably quite a good reason for their success now is that they put in place 20 years ago that kind of procedure. But I thought, hold on a minute, why, why don't the big architect firms, why don't the big designers, why don't the big fashion models areas do the same? So could, how would you do it? And, and, and in the end I came up with this idea, not just me but a whole team of us, um, that what we needed was a place where those people could meet and design materials together that the whole thing from going from a molecule all the way to a prototype that could be done in an environment where you've got scientists, you've got engineers, you've got chemists and physicists but you've also got fashion designers, uh, you know, architecture students, architects but also anthropology, people who understand where the materials go at the end of life, how people relate to them because if you don't put all that in at the beginning and this is of course what designers are very good at but um, then you're going to get a huge part of waste at the end, which is what we find we have. And the world's getting more and more complex. There are more and more materials out there, and the interrelation between them is getting more complex. So it's, it's, there's an even greater need now for this much more holistic view of designing and building and then remaking objects, whether they be a jet engine, an airplane, um, or a plastic bottle, which, by the way, is a very good material for this. <laughs> um, and um, and you need a community of people who are really dedicated, not just to kind of pushing the boundaries on what's possible, but also completely reimagining what designing, making, and using materials is. And that is what we are hoping the materials, like uh, the Institute of Making, that community is what we're building. You know, it's a place, it's a workshop, it's got a materials library, it's got tools. It's got a little lecture theatre area, but it's but more than that, it's the people. And we have about 3,500 members now across the whole of UCL, um, and they they range from all different disciplines. So we have architects, we have artists, we have uh, chemists, physicists, engineers, material scientists, we have anthropologists, we have historians, we have English graduates, we have medics, and um, it's really we've been open for a year and a half. It's, it's really coming together and we're not there yet, I mean there's lots of work to be done um, but the latest thing that we've brought uh, to try and encourage the community is this materials library app and trying to get people, uh, I think this is a, a more general issue in general with, with workshops like ours and prototype places which are multidisciplinary is that people's materials knowledge is very deep but it's not exactly broad, it doesn't connect up and so we finding a way in which someone who knows everything there is to know about steel can talk to someone who's a fashion designer. That that those that requires some cross uh, crossing links and and finding ways to do that is one of the things that we are working on. Thank thank you very much. I, I mean I'd just like to dig into a, a little bit more. So how I mean in terms of higher education, how siloed are today's universities and and. Uh, it, it's something I, in there's another video on the disruptive innovation festival website when you speak about how this is an interdisciplinary space and I guess from an outside view you think of universities as being a place of learning where there's all these different departments and uh, and and lots of people with different specialisms with the with great potential to come together but but how siloed are our universities and, and and why do you think that is is and how unique is is the Institute of Making is this part of a broader movement to to, to combine these disciplines as, as as you're doing I think in 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 materials uh, research terms we are quite ahead of the curve um, but obviously I mean there are other disciplines that have have had different takes on how to create a multidisciplinary environment around the world and pharmaceuticals have, have 
had their own way of doing it and uh, computer science, you know, MIT Media Lab, um, and there's the, the Wies Institute in Harvard for biologically inspired things. So, so lots of people, of course, have recognized the siloed nature of universities, and that's the area I, th I suppose I'm most familiar with. Um, there are trying to get over it. I mean, I think the thing we found for our, from our, our perspective is that we are dedicated to materials and making as the way into connecting people's knowledge sets. And so whenever people come to us and say, well, we could, give, we could have this seminar, we say, well, no, let's not have a seminar. Let's just make stuff together. And it, and it sounds so simple. And, and there's, of course, a lot of intellectual snobbery, which, which we've had to fight. Um, because there is a kind of, in the academy, there is this kind of hierarchy of knowledge. And at the top is a paper in, a, in you know, the best research journal in the world, a Nobel Prize, you know, Nature Science, uh, these are this, and, and, and essentially, an idea is thought to be the most important thing that come out of a university. I mean, that's, you know, that's the status quo. Um, so, if if what's coming out of your institute is things, right? You're you're down the packing order, and and um, so one of our ambitions, of course, is to get that as equal status. That that of course, that I mean, I write research papers. I've more than a hundred research papers, but is not my I don't want to end my career, you know, having sp spent my life dedicated to making new materials with just a big list of papers. I mean, I want I want to see the stuff in the world. I want to see it, you know, it's a bit like having children, right? You kind of want them to thrive. You want them to do stuff. You want them to kind of have a great time, but you want them to change the world. And and um, I don't think you really, I think academics have kind of been slow to understand that changing the world, if that's what they want to do, and not all academics do, isn't going to be done by research papers. I mean, it's an important part of what we do. It writes things down, it hands that information over to the next generation. But, but really, if you want to have a big impact, you've got to get out into the world and make stuff. And so, creating a place that actually people could make stuff from the word go. Like I know, let's say you know nothing about welding. The first thing I don't think you should do is sit down and have a six-week lecture on welding. What you should do is weld, right? And come right bang up against your ignorance because sooner or later these welds are going to fall apart, probably soon. <laughs> and you're going to realize that you can't only weld certain metals to other metals, that if you want to weld an aluminium, you are really in trouble. If, you, if, you, if you're thinking about joining you know, a bronze thing to this thing over here which is made of zinc, you know, really, you, you, you need to know more. But you won't appreciate your ignorance and you won't appreciate why you need to know the theory until you've actually had a go. And also, I think... I think the theory has no it has no purchase on the world. You know, you, you constantly theory can come go in and out of your head. You can pass an exam, you can write a research paper, but it can it can really have no influence on the world until it turns into a thing. And so you universities have to create places where people can make things as well as read and write. And so libraries, in my view, in universities should be important. They are important, but making spaces are as important as libraries as a way of creating art. You think through your hands much more than you appreciate. So I would like to see all universities in the world having as big a make space as a library. That's what I would like to see. I think I mean, that reflects what we're seeing elsewhere with, I mean, on the Disruptive Innovation Festival, and we know that uh, there's a, uh, we've had some interest and some uh, some sessions from people involved with the Fab Labs and the, and the, the maker movement more broadly. And I was going to ask you about um, there's a big area in the middle of the Institute of Making um, that is what many people, uh, I'm sure, on this on this session would recognise as a, a hack space, a, a make space, a fab lab, with all the equipment that that comes with that. I was going to ask you of kind of what the importance of that is, but from your answer, then you you've kind of shown the I think the educational importance of of a uh, of of making, but. What are your views on the the economic importance of of the maker movement for for uh, for the future economy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, economics is obviously important, and um, there's some great stats that Nesta came up with, which is a which is a is a kind of institute. Uh, what are they? An organisation, a uh, uh, sort of charitable or social enterprise, anyway, in the UK, whose 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 task is to kind of kind of help innovation and they they came up with some great stats which is that you know something like one in ten of 
every object that gets bought gets hacked in some way at home. You know, there's an enormous amount of hacking of objects, of things, of technology that happens in the house. And my feeling is that um, uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in a house with a workshop. I grew up where we basically fiddled with everything, took things apart, and that, that, that I got that from my parents and from my brothers, and, and you know, it was a culture of that. And I, I think we're, we're kind of losing that. And there's, there's, especially in very developed and dense cities, which is where most people are ending up living now. There's, there's a stat which, you know, 60, 70, perhaps 80% of people will live in big cities in, in about 20 years' time. And that's crammed people into small spaces, and it's meant that, that whereas I was lucky enough to have quite a big workshop that my dad had, Actually, people, they've been converted now to extra bedrooms, renting them out. And so access to workshops is really, I think, as important as access to a library. In fact, I'd say it's probably more important. <laughs> and that, and once you have that sense of innovation, of being able to hack things, of a confidence that actually the world is ours, we created it, right? It's a human thing, <laughs> all this stuff. Um, I think that will, I think you don't have to worry about that. Then that will bubble over into economics. I mean, I really feel like that's, the economic thing will happen. You don't need to kind of, in a sense, worry about it. But what I do think you need to worry about is this is this opportunity to learn how to do it and have access to workshops. So I think the public workshop kind of movement, I, which encompasses fab labs, make spaces, um, hack spaces, the, all the different flavors. I mean, I love the fact that there are all these different ways of thinking about it, doing it. Opportunities are getting much bigger. But we're way, way, way off being in the place where I think it's going to have a significant economic impact in, let's say, the next couple of years. I mean, we're we're looking we're we're, we're looking at something ten years away, aren't we? And I would like to see a public workshop in every village, every town. You know, I think that should be a right. You know, I mean, if if this if if the UK government was serious about wanting to pump prime innovation, they would they would uh, put a lot of weight behind this. I think. Um, because in the same way the Victorians realized that if you didn't have access to libraries, most of the population could, wouldn't be able to read books and learn and understand about being having an active participation in a democratic society. Now everyone can read a book. I mean, it's not that hard, but what they can't do is they can't make stuff. And so the so the broader uh, shifts maybe maybe a few years away, but but you started. Um talking today uh, a few minutes ago about about businesses about your your earlier interactions with with big businesses and I and I think um, there are many businesses out there who are grappling with some materials challenges or or, or making designing challenges um, whether they want to get their products back or, or make make them to be made again um, does the does the Institute of Making feed back into business? Does it does it interact with business in any in any way, or is that again something that or that that will come? Yeah, well, I mean, we had our first uh, spin out company started uh, a few months ago, so that's I mean, I think that is one of our you know I think we have these hopes to create this community that is innovative, but also is influential in how the world is made. You know, I think in 10, 20 years time, I'd love to look back and find out where our alumni have gone. And how they've changed, you know, really have changed how things are made, and start their own companies, and these companies have grown. So I, we, I think we've got to look, and we are looking for the long term. But it's nice to see that the early signs of shoots are there. But but also we're not. It's not just about us, maybe starting companies or our our, our members starting companies. But it's also, yeah, as you say, talking to, to to other companies and being a part of them. I think recently what we've done, which is perhaps important. Well, we feel is like our, perhaps a role that we can play more clearly because the problem we've got is space. Is that we have three thousand five hundred members. The place is packed. Um, we can't, you know. And also, it's not even just the question. If you threw some money at us and said, I mean, do do. By the way, <laughs> uh, if you threw some money at us, it's not. So it's not just a question of of cutting and pasting, making the place bigger because it's so successful. Because actually, I think there is a scale where um, a scale of of where a community interacts with each other in a very healthy way, and where it can get too big, and so I would rather see a distributed um, approach to make spaces and fab labs than than some big, you know, some big warehouse sized ones, which I I feel in a sense could lose their heart and soul, and 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 this is this is what we're trying to develop, right? We do, we're trying to develop people's technical knowledge with with their social and cultural. Um, awareness, and I think so. So, 
so I think that's the, one of the things we're trying to rub off on companies. And I visit lots of companies. And I visited um, Airbus last week, who have just started their own in-house fab lab, which they're calling, uh, it's quite a cool name, what is it, Protospace. Um, and it's going to go across the whole of Air, Airbus, the whole of, you know, so they're going to have different centers of, of protospaces. And it's to get the internal company's innovation making, trying to push ahead ideas that would otherwise, in a big company like Airbus, get left on the side because they're not, let's say, business, they're not about next year's objectives. They're about five, ten years away. But also trying to make sure that the people who go into those companies are people who might have started out in our place. They're very keen that if you've had an experience at the Institute of Making and what you've done is you've come to UCL and you've studied engineering, but at the same time you, you've kind of done three or four collaborative projects with a fashion designer one year, an architect another year, and maybe another year you, you know, you've, you've done something with an you know, anthropologist. If you then come out of that experience having made 10, 20 prototypes in your time here, having developed a depth of experience and knowledge of materials in an engineering context, if you then go into Airbus and you're told to sit down at a desk and just produce this bracket for the next 10 years, you're just going to die intellectually, and you're going to feel like, well, I really want to be part of this company, you know? And I think Airbus have realized that, and a lot of the big companies have realized that, that you, you need to, get to, to, to keep that, that spirit alive inside people, even though you're, you're producing big, big things like planes. <laughs> um, and I think that's some of the big companies' biggest dilemma, is how to create an innovative in, in, internal environment through making, but at the same time, you know, obviously create these enormous, very successful products. Mm. I'm sure that's something, that I'm, from our, our work with businesses at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, something they're, they're also grappling with, trying to experiment with these these new ideas while, whilst having to meet deadlines and other sort of requirements. Um, we've got some great questions coming in. I'd like to get to in a few minutes. And if you haven't asked a question yet, you can do so by using the Hangout Q&A app. So click the button to be part of the conversation. Uh, and you can ask your questions using uh, Q&A. You can also uh, ask questions on Twitter using hashtag thinkdiff. Mark, I'd just like to speak a little bit about the materials library before we get into the uh, the questions. This is the materials library app that was released to the App Store last Thursday. Um, so can you just explain what the digital materials library is, how, how and maybe who is meant to use it, and why it's a significant step for you? Yeah, so we started the materials library because um, we found, I mean, anyone out there who hasn't got a library of material, I really urge you to, to get one going. And it's as simple as, well, let me just show you this. So it's as simple as just collecting materials. And this is essentially, I was known for a long time as the guy with the material suitcase. I would go to companies, and they would, they would show me materials they're using. That's an acrylic, I think. And I would just collect a little bit in a bottle. <laughs> Done. Or I go to a razor blade company, and I'd and they would let me. And that's very nice of them. Collect the kind of blanks before they've been sharpened and heat treated, and that I, I love that sort of stuff. And I've been doing it uh, for 20 years. And the the point of all this stuff is not that it's somehow going to be. Um, I'm going to make lots of things out of this myself, prototype wise. These 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 turn out to be. Um, communication tools between two people, one person who doesn't know anything about this but is intrigued, and another person who has some knowledge of it. And it's, it's amazing when we have our materials library open days and people come and visit the library, how when you put a material in someone's hand, right, like a gold spoon, <laughs> how it will unlock questions but also ideas. It will unlock thoughts uh, and it will get the whole conversation flowing. And it can go in many different directions. So this was a spoon we made to do with a study in taste. And people might wonder why different materials taste differently from each other. And we've done quite a lot of research on that. Or the razor blade might be about, OK, so actually, you know, what is the point of hair on people's faces? So it might take you down a whole biological route. Um, you know, Why do we, we spend so much money and time and effort taking hair away? What's so wrong about hair? All those things. So from a biological perspective or an anthropological perspective. So this, this library, and we have 1,000, 1,500, maybe more downstairs in the Institute, is, is in a way a kind of snapshot of what humans have made, right? This is us. <laughs> and each one of these is an idea. Each one of these is trying to solve a problem, or it's an idea, or it's a, it encapsulates an approach to the world. So whether you're an English grad or a history grad, 
or you're a fashion designer or you're an engine designer, this stuff this stuff is is the kind of ingredients of your world. It really is. And so um, what we've done with the app is just to kind of allow you to, if you're not actually physically in the space, is to actually have a look at this stuff. So we've got some great photos, images, audio, video. Um, but also give you a little bit of a background on it. We're not trying to be Wikipedia for materials. We're just trying to kind of say to you, look, there is so much wealth and complexity in the material world. And in particular, in the context of a make space stroke fab lab, it's really important this because otherwise what tends to happen is that you just go down the road of the familiar materials you've always used. And actually, um, so for instance, you know, plywood, it's a great material. It's a little, huge amount of it in fab labs, but it's not the only wood. And we've got, we must have about 50 samples of wood downstairs. And they're so different from each other. And we've got cork and foams and all these other things. Um, so it's just going to widen your head, understand that we've created a complex world, and now we need to look after it. <laughs> um, so that's it. And the app, the app is kind of, you know, you can, you can grab it. And in fact, um, this week, later this week, we're going to we're going to also launch the web interface. So um, the app's great um, if you if you've got those kind of Apple devices, um, but but we're going to have the web interface for anyone who who wants to have a look at this stuff. And uh, I, I again, I do recommend people go and download it now because I know that the team behind this at the Institute of Making want to hear more about what you think of it um, and about how you might use it. Yeah. Um, we've had one question here from Rene Katterberg who says, uh, in light of the circular economy, how much focus is there on separating materials when creating them? So you've just spoken and, and we can see in the suitcase about this huge variety of materials. How much focus maybe in in Institute of Making and then that you see more widely in design um, is there on separating these different types of materials? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's the Great Recovery Project in the UK which is, is has spent a lot of time thinking about this in, from a design perspective. Um, I, I have to say, I think from a material science and engineering perspective, it's, 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 it's really disturbingly way down the list of priorities. But if you look and this is a kind of an opinion of mine, which is having gone to a lot of materials departments in my life and living in them and engineering departments, is that actually the type of person who goes into research um, ends up is quite forward-looking. And so everyone's very excited about creating new things with new functionalities and solving problems that people have got now. But it, it, it is very unusual to find that um, people are thinking about end of life really very unusual and I just feel like there's an enormous piece of education that has to happen to realize that and but it, it it's really difficult within the context of the Institute of Making to to do that because okay so you can do that in terms of a lecture you can say look guys don't design and think that you don't know how to get rid of the end and, and put all these different things in and we do right that's how we teach but when you actually go out to the Institute of Making you say to someone first of all just make make a prototype helmet or make a prototype teapot, whatever it is that you're, we've set them a task or they've, they've set themselves a task. There's such a learning curve of creation that it feels like we're hampering them that we're in, order, in a prototyping stage for them to think about the end of life. It just feels really difficult to I'll constantly stop them at every point along that prototype design loop and go, hold on a minute, you haven't thought about end of life, hold on a minute, you haven't thought about end of life, hold on a minute, hey, you haven't thought about end of life. And I don't think we really know how to do it that well. Um, you might sort of say, well, the, the Institute of Making should be a closed loop in itself, right? So we should get these materials in as samples and bigger samples, and actually we should re completely recycle them within the space. And at the moment, that's just not possible. And uh, there are so many economies of scale that make some materials possible to recycle, like plastics, for instance, and others is much harder. But we have started one project, which, which I think, and I really hope that this, you know, this is, you know, I think we need a tangible goal, and I think this is it, which is that we want um, to start using our own filament in our 3D printers. So we want to recycle our own filament and recycle the plastics at UCL that all the students and staff are using, and tr and make them into the filament that we use. So that feels to me like, okay, that is something we can do. is a tangible first step that won't hamper people's creativity. Um, things like woods 
can we recycle them here? It's going to be very difficult. Um, metals, I mean, there's, again, you know, there's a, there's a scale of recycling that, you know, metals, for instance, the car industry, you know, recycles 80% of every car. And it's a really impressive achievement. You know, whatever you think about cars and their environmental impact, the car industry has got its act together, and that's probably largely with EU regulations. But, but, but it's a scale issue, right? So, so I think that there is. So I'm, I'm back to my problem, which is that if you want to in, really integrate this value, uh, this culture of designing for end life, it seems to me that you've got to do it right at the beginning. Everything you make, everything you make, but it's really hard to do. And I would really welcome people out there who've got. Who found workshop practices that can do this? Um, and just to pick up on that point of kind of what you're capable of doing in in, in your lab, and I'm sure again it's a problem others are grappling with. Um, in, in one of your recent uh, uh, documentaries on on BBC Two, um, you were mentioning that it's I think that I love the phrase that it's our mastery of stuff that has led to some amazing progress in 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 technology and, and uh, enabling us to speak on computers and, and live in comfort. Um, what's, what is the role of, of maybe, of maybe governments and other, other rules of the game? So it's, it's kind of systemic conditions, um, in, in shifting to a, to a, a, a new type of economy. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel that, um, I, I, I honestly feel that there is quite a big role for regulation. Um, I think if you leave, for instance, plastics, right? They're a great material. They've allowed so much, you know, they've given us so much comfort, and they, they allow us to express ourselves in ways that we couldn't before. And you know, think of a world without, you know, trainers and you know, all, you know, if we're all walking around in leather shoes the whole time, you know, it just wouldn't feel, you know, and rubber. Think of a world without rubber. You know, all these things. So, but, but, um. But if you give the commercial world all, you know, every, you know, just complete free reign, every single business will hone a plastic to their optimized to their needs, and so they'll all be different from each other. And then when you collect them all together, and this is the issue of scale, right? You then find that you're trying to, you're trying to recycle niche bits of plastic from different manufacturers, and it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't. Well, it's not economic, and so. Um, so what they did in Japan is they just said, look, these water bottles, right? It turns out that if they if they're coloured, so this this tops a problem. Um, if they're all if they if they're transparent and they're all made of PET, let's say, or one another plastic, if every single one of them is made of this, right? Okay, so that means they're not every single and and they can't be coloured. So that's the law in Japan. Then you have to do everything with the labels, right? But it means that they have 90% recycling rates. And is it harming the company's competitiveness, and is it is it making their economy less competitive by doing that? I don't think so. I think it's actually making it more competitive because they import all of their petrochemicals, right? They import every single drop of oil. So for them, you know, holding on to this stuff is really important. And here we are so we're just so gluttonous and wasteful because we're pumping it out of the ground cheaper than milk, and. Um, and that really disturbs me. <laughs> I find it really awful. And uh, you know, it's it feels like to me an ethical, moral case as well, which is that we should just we shouldn't have this culture of just of gluttony and and wastefulness. Um, but but I do think, you know, I do think a few rules would would help a lot with that. Thank you. We, I'm going to take a couple more questions from uh, from the Q and A. Um, don't forget, you can ask Mark anything you like about materials and making, uh, education, uh, or, or the economy. Um, use the Q and A app or ThinkDiff hashtag ThinkDiff on Twitter. Um, we've got a question here um, from uh, Bez Domney, who says uh, Web 2.0 turning prosumers back into one-way consumers could be making a nat could be could making be a natural response of people seeking the space to create, where it has been commandeered by net giants? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like um, I, I'm, I don't blame. Let's say I don't. I don't put the blame in the very big successful companies for the sort of for the predicament we find ourselves in. I, I, I honestly think that 
especially in the West, where, where people are relatively wealthy. I mean, you know, you can talk about disparity of wealth, but people, there isn't absolute, not very much absolute poverty. poverty. So it's in our hands, I think, to kind of make decisions, and, and our online clicking decisions are those decisions, and, and uh, I do think that you're absolutely right, that um, people you know, people not constantly recycling every single gadget they have every 12 months, you know, having a new iPhone just because the new iPhone is out uh, is, is would be a response that those companies would listen to, you know, if, if people didn't have a product cycle in their own head spaces, and it, albeit it is encouraged, I think, by marketing and all these things, which which are powerful agents and, and people are con in control of the money are, are, are definitely kind of pumping us with desire. <laughs> But I think you know we 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 need we need to kind of, as you say, um, have have things that we care about and hang on to and have longer relationships with. And one of the things I, I particularly feel the material scientists have got to offer on this front is 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 um, creating materials that can be can be repaired, um, creating materials technologies for repairing things like phones and laptops to put that. Power, but also enjoyment and that sense of, yeah, a sense of not being completely estranged. Like these objects come into our lives and they revolutionise our lives, but they also kind of, if you're not careful, they 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 terrorise us because we don't know how they're made and and they, we're at their complete mercy when they go wrong and and then we have to throw them away and we have to buy something else for an enormous amount of money or sign a contract. And it feels to me that relationship really needs to change. <laughs> And but we should demand it changes, right? We should demand it changes, and we can do something about that by just hanging on to gadgets for longer. Probably the most important thing that anyone could do is to not upgrade. I have a, I have a, my mobile phone company constantly phones me up and says, "You're due an upgrade," and I go, "Actually, I'm fine. My phone's working fine." But you're due an upgrade. I go, "But it, but it's fine. <laughs> I just want cheaper prices. <laughs> can you do that for me?" And then they they say, "No." It turns out it's weird, um, but. Uh, I think if we all resisted the upgrade for a year, God, that would send a powerful message. Uh, my my recent most recent call from my provider was about if I'd like another contract. So I think uh, when they can't get you to actually upgrade, maybe maybe just add another one on. Um, we've got a question from Sam who uh, says, "Do you think the trend that the trend towards using materials in design honestly is something that consumers will latch onto soon? Are you not trying to disguise plastic as metal?" Is this trend perhaps prompted by a lot of user interfaces ditching skeuomorphism? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in truth to the material, you know, it's the old Bauhaus, you know, um, uh, motto, I suppose. Um, yes. Um, I mean, I do think that um, it's important that uh, materials, essentially, I, I mean, I don't think it should be anything ashamed of. Plastic. That's, I suppose that's that's the thing I mostly feel like dressing plastic up as metal um, when it's not metal and it's not it's not you know the reason why obviously the reason why um, people coat plastics with metal in order to make them look like metal is because there's a there's a cultural value associated with that of robustness of long life of um, of it being essentially sort of more valuable and um, as you say, I think that we could actually we could just make those plastics themselves higher value because they're more recyclable. Let's say, let's say every every plastic in every phone was the same plastic, so every phone's plastic is going to get recycled. Then people might go, "Oh, I definitely want this phone because I know that at the end of its life, it's going to get recycled." And I think that that, as you say, the truth of materials in terms of their ability to be recycled could be something that we could really change the world for the better with. Um, it's, inter it's an interesting. <laughs> Uh, you know, like um, I don't know if you buy uh, yogurt in the supermarket in those four packs, you know, and it's usually made of polystyrene. Those packs, and the reason, <laughs> the reason it's made of polystyrene and not, let's say, high density polyethylene or PET, is because polystyrene is actually quite brittle, and so you can go like crack, that crack sound, right? Crack, and you can break them off into four things for four members of your friends or family, and that feels very sociable, all right? <laughs> and that's truth of the material, right? That is truth of the material, but but unless there's a lot more things made of polystyrene like that in the supermarket, that that polystyrene will not get recycled because it's just too small a segment in the whole. And if you change that material to high-density polyethylene, which is the same material made of, of the milk bottles, 
you would have it highly recycled, but you wouldn't get a crack. <laughs> You know, so you have to change the design so that you could have a sociable, nice feeling. Because the crack makes it sound like it's fresh. I mean, I, I know this sounds odd, but it is a sub piece of sense aesthetics psychology research. So, so designers could have a really intelligent view on this and go, "Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it use high density polyethylene because that'd be more recycled. But I'm gonna change the design of yogurt pots so they 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 are also pleasing. And if we can get those two things right, intelligent design in that sense, truth to material, as you say." I think there's a lot, you know, that's an interesting challenge to have. I, I was about to mention that um, someone once told me that the click was uh, to make it seem like it's fresh, but then I remember that was you that, that told me that, so <laughs> okay. I didn't try and add that. Um, so uh, we've got two questions on a similar note here, one from uh, in Google and one from, um, from Carlos on Twitter. So... Um, uh, we have uh, one question says, "What's the what impact is the maker movement having on redistributed manufacturing in cities and megacities?" Um, and the other is uh, from Carlos: "How can we grow the maker movement in the UK, create more open uh, maker spaces, and why don't you open the Institute of Making to the public more?" Um, and uh, I I know from speaking to one of your colleagues uh, at the Institute of Making who's Kind of mapping all the amazing makerspaces in the in London, and that's a, that's actually a surprising amount. Um, so maybe it's a case of documenting it. But um, yeah. what do you think of those, those questions? I mean, um, Liz has been doing some great work trying to, and, and so Zoe Laughlin, who you know, they've been working together to to kind of map out the London spaces around around us anyway. And partly, it was kind of provoked by this by the huge amount of demand to be members of our space. But as I said, our space is 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 so packed already, and um, because we're in the very fortunate position that we've got a very enlightened uh, backer, which is UCL itself, UCL Engineering in particular, um, we we you know we have been able to open our doors to every single discipline in UCL for free, and so there are disciplines at UCL like anthropology and English and history who never have lab spaces, and now they have one, so it's great for them and great for all of us because we have them in our space but it means that we're kind of packed and it's difficult for us to open to the public we do have ambitions to kind of do it more and we we are open on our every three months for an open day we've got one coming up the 22nd of November so everyone's welcome to come please do come but um, so that's the problem it's basically just we just are completely and utterly oversubscribed internally and and we have a particular mission which is to which is to change the research environment and, and the status of the prototype inside academia. But I would say the more general question, how, how make spaces can be encouraged in the UK? I, I feel like um, local authorities, I mean, there's a really great model for turning libraries into, into make spaces which, which both, you know, in which both functions, the community function. Right? So if you're going to put money into a community resource and you're a local authority, why put all of it into books when, in fact, Really, um, the thing that people have most deficit of in their lives is not books. It's, it's opportunity to make things and repair things. I really feel like that the first thing we could all do is just is campaign in our local areas to get the library spaces and the money allocated to that widened out into a community space which has 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 made, has basically a, a local workshop. And I think that would send a massive, powerful message. And I think the government should get behind this, and they should also be singing from the same theme tune. And I, I feel like. The other thing is that, I mean, I, I've been sort of thinking about, just, you know, could I start a local hack space, make space in my local area where I live, and 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 actually the the the, ob the obstacles are not are not are not easy to overcome. Um, um, there's an, there's money issues. There's also health and safety worries, and um, and and the thing that we've discovered, I guess it's not it's not a big discovery, but is that um, you've got there are lots and lots of people who will volunteer for free, and they are a great resource, fantastic. But you cannot skip over the fact you need someone, in fact, a couple of people at least, who are paid to do this. This is, should not be done on a kind of shoestring. It's really important. You know, you pay librarians a proper salary to, to look after the books and look after the space. You really you can't do this and hope it's going to be safe and you're going to build a great environment if you don't pay people properly for this. Um, so, so I think that realization of that is that um, we need to, you know, I don't think, you know, most most places actually, uh, I, I, say, I 
hate to say this, but it pains me how much public money goes into public art. Right? It really pains me. Like we have a million of and it, and you know why? You know why in my opinion anyway, why? Because the arts and humanities people, they run. They run they run the UK, right? They are in all the top jobs. And they value art, and of course they funnel money into art because they love it, right? But so us lot, right? The makers, we have to get into those jobs, and we have to funnel money into the workshops, and we have to kind of completely change, you know, like why, why, why put fifty grand into some public art when in fact there's quite a lot of art, and let's put fifty grand into an it. So I think that kind of thing, like we've all got to sort of work towards this and encourage this to happen. We, we've got some good questions coming in now from uh, uh, on a range of subjects, really, and maybe this. Kind of links to the, the the health and safety point that you you were mentioning that kind of when you start messing around with materials and, and opening products up and and engaging in making it, it can be uh, potentially uh, dangerous or, 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 or risky. Um, one question we had was how do you encourage children to get stuck into making things and take an interest in materials because obviously uh, getting getting uh, people interested while they're young is is a good step. Um, and then secondly. Um, have you seen maker kids in Toronto? Uh, do you think that making improves mental health and well-being? Yes. Well, on that last point, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think, I mean, it's very widely recognised. I mean, if you go into any of the um, therapeutic, you know, areas of, of mental health, you find that making is used everywhere. Like as a, as a, as it's clearly recognised as something for people who are already mentally ill to help them. But I think that. Living in a world where you you only take things in, you buy things and then you throw them away. That that isn't, you know, for for so-called normal people. I don't really think there are any normal people. But anyway, let's let's talk about people who are not diagnosed as mentally ill. I think all of us, you know, um, benefit from making stuff. So, the the example I would give is imagine imagine a world where flats were built in which there was no kitchen in any of them. That actually they just expect you to buy food and microwave it, and that was that was what they expect you to do. And then let's, let's say that every city turned into that kind of place. And then there were a few weirdos who kind of made their own food and had kitchens. And they were like, oh my god, I can't believe those guys make their own food. But the thing is, it's re as anyone knows, it's extremely pleasurable to make your own food. You feel a completely different person. Um, it nourishes you, you know, more than just, you know, more than just uh, in in terms of, of of calories, right? And and the other thing is, it puts you in touch with your history, puts you in touch with your culture, puts you in touch with where you came from, the people who your ancestors came from, and these processes. And um, so, I don't think make spaces and making is any different from cooking. I really think that the reason we've got rid of workshops in schools and and houses and is just because we we've let we've let We've let them do it to us, <laughs> you know. We we haven't hang on to that real pleasure, the pleasure of being a part of the made world, of being a, a, an active participant in that, uh, of not feeling completely at loss when something breaks and thinking, no, actually, I could repair that. Actually, I do have a, I could actually repair my car, I could repair my bike, I could repair my washing machine. That what an amazing feeling to give everyone, and you know, what a dem democratic feeling that is. So, I think we've got a long way to go. I think it should. I think a good place to start is schools, and I think that I would love to see every school with a with an after school make space club. And, and I don't think it's impossible. I think you could you could you could put um most schools have a playground which you could put a container in, and you could put quite a good lot of 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 kit in there for making. And the reason I say after school make space because I don't, I feel like I don't want to put another thing on the plates of teachers. I feel like they're already hard done by, especially in the UK. People are constantly changing the curriculum. They're constantly making them do different things. They don't feel like they've got the skills, and you know they've spent 20 years learning how to teach English. Why should they now have to teach making? So I feel like we should just we should just offer that to them. Like we will after school, <laughs> you know, we will give you and your people a chance to make prototypes, and it will, and of course, it will be relevant to their studies because you know they're studying the history of economics. They'll see pins and you know everything is made out of something, right? So <laughs> you know. So, so I feel like that's the way to go. Is more access to make spaces. Schools is a very great place to start. It's hugely enjoyable. So you don't have to persuade any young person that they'd like it because most of them do. Um, but the hard thing, and as I guess everyone listening to this knows, is that if you want to have even an afternoon of making, you have to do quite a lot of prep for that. You have to get stuff in. It's, it's, you have to buy stuff. Um, and then, and let's go even further than that. Like, let's say we're going to make, as as we did the other day, you know, some casting some pewter. 
and we're going to make some little brooches. And so we're going to introduce some people to the idea of jewellery, of casting liquid metals, of, of how to make a mould. Now you're going to tell me I've got to do it sustainably. Now I've got to do it so everything at the end of that process, either they hang on to, they take away with them, they value for 20 years, and that goes back into the... Or all of the leftover casts and all of the leftover materials and all of the leftover stuff has to go back into the system. Now, that's much harder for me to do. We don't even know how to do it at the moment. So, 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 so we need a kind of a, a network of people who support each other in finding those kind of activities that are sustainable activities that inculcate. And I think that hasn't been done, and that needs to be done. We've got a few questions coming in. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left. A lot of the questions now focus on on actually how designing and how we incorporate materials into into designing products. Um, what are the questions we have in? Uh, what about creating products that last much longer? What's the role of material science in enabling this? Yeah, and, and I think you've got to you've got to acknowledge the fact that a lot of companies um, build in you know obsolescence in their products. I mean that's a fact. So so um, and and there's a huge economic imperative to do this. So it isn't just it isn't just that it is it possible because clearly it is possible. Like you 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 only have to look at old versions of things like cars and bikes and to realize that you know you can spec things to the point where they'll last you 30 years you can easily make a bike that will last you 30 years but but modern bikes that you buy perhaps for 150 pounds are not going to last you 130 years and so who who's 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 making that happen is it is it the, is it the people who are buying the bikes who want to buy a 150 pound bike or are, or is it the manufacturers who are sort of pushing these on you and i think it's a bit of both um, we've got really excited about the fact that we can make really cheap things and everyone can have a bike, um, but at the same time that devalues the object itself and you don't have that relationship built up over years and years and years. I think all of us probably listening to this have our bikes that we've had for you know for a long time and there is there's a lot to be said for that. So um, having I'm not going to dodge the question though. So you're saying I mean, I'm so I'm basically saying that it isn't really materials that's the problem there. I think in general, but but. But I think materials can do something big for this. So one of the things I think there's going to be a move towards composites, and the reason is is for energy. So uh, so at the moment airplanes are going, you know, much more carbon fiber. Um, you know, Formula One racing is carbon fiber. So you're going to see a lot more composites in bikes and in cars, but they're not very recyclable. And also robustly, they're not so robust to the everyday knocking of things, right? So anyone who's got a carbon fiber bike, you can bet they keep it inside, very well protected, right? It's so so we need so materials, this is a material science problem, right? How do you make lightweight composites? So they 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 are they are the, the way to save on energy, there's no doubt about it. But that can fully feed back into the stream, but at the same time will last you thirty years. And and have that same same quality of steel, let's say, which we know you buy something in steel. That will be recycled. There is no doubt about it. There's a whole waste stream dedicated to it, and also you, it'll last you your whole life. I mean, there's, uh, a steel frame will last you well, maybe not your whole life, but at least 30 years. And we need we need the new composites to be of that quality. You know, it really feels it needs to feel like that. Um, and I think electronics is another area which you probably are thinking of, and rightly so, where you know we could make electronics. Um, Systems which we which are either swappable out, so you, so actually it's much easier to upgrade your much easier to upgrade your power of your computer. So you don't throw away the whole computer. What you do is you you know you have the bit that is upgradable. So the technology that's moving fast, you make sure that bit's up, take up, and the rest of it, you know, should last. Um, I think there just isn't enough of that going on. That isn't the focus of most of these companies, and I think the reason it's not their focus is because people are quite happy. It turns out to buy something new and to throw the other one away and they don't care what happens to the other one and in fact it just goes into a blender mostly and this is terrible <laughs> so um, so I think there's a long way to go but I think mature scientists there needs to be a massive cultural change in mature science towards um, towards these issues we, we had a question in from Barry actually that um, that was on along these lines as well saying uh, materials cocktails have an unplanned consequence for society um, how, how can we do a better job of investigating these consequences during the early design process hopefully um, Barry some, some of that has answered your question um, I, 
just conscious of time because we've got about six minutes left and some fantastic questions to, to ask. Um, another one here, um, uh, hypothetical. Let's say I repair my washing machine, but and this is something you've written about yourself, Mark, about your party for your washing machine. Um, uh, let's say you repair your washing machine um, by printing a gear at your local fab lab. The washer has a history of this piece breaking. Uh, I upload the schematic to a site so others can print it. Do you think we need a policy change to protect this type of maker sharing? Mm, yeah, okay. So you, I can see there is going to be a big issue around this. Um, and a lot of the companies are, are very worried about this. Um, so basically, in the, in the big scheme of things, sort of 3D scanning of objects and and the whole plans going on 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 the web and then being open sourced. Um, yeah, uh, it it's a very complex question and I don't have a simple answer. But um, what do I think? I think that I think we we'll have to try. I think the first thing to do is trailblaze and show that it's possible and give people power and. I suppose I think feel like letting companies do the right thing is the first thing to do. I mean, small companies are run by people that I know, you know. Like, you know, if you had a small company and you were making a decent living but not you weren't rich, and then suddenly your livelihood looked like it was going to be. <laughs> and and but, but but I think I mean there are companies who who cre create objects that, and they create the spare parts and they make the spare parts very well available. And I think companies who are not doing that. I feel like they could easily be encouraged to do it by by the act, kind of activities that you're talking about, and um, I think as long as you keep within the law, um, sharing sharing ways and keeping you know machines going seems to me a good thing. Um, I would hate to see someone you know I'd hate to see a company going down the road of of trying to shut that operation down and suing the person, which let's face it, you would be liable to. Um, but instead of just going, hold on a minute, there is a demand for spares and demand for the digital files, and why don't we do this? Because actually, building a brand around being more sustainable surely is going to be a better economic practice. And and I know that I and lots of other people, and probably yourselves, will buy things that that are built to be repaired. And so I feel like there is a real role for the kind of activity you're talking about to raise awareness and show that it can be done. But also, I would say, kind of, I'm not a kind of. I feel like you can make the companies do the right thing. <laughs> you can persuade them to do the right thing by kind of working with them. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, so time for one or two more questions. Um, one here, uh, we've spoken a lot about about materials and materials in products. This question says, materials are important, but what about pathways, the uh, logistics? Um, for these materials, if you, I think it means if a company or maybe a, a maker puts something on the market, surely the means to deal with it should be offered at the same time. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think that this is, we need a complete and utter change in mentality about when you buy something, you should really know where it's going to, what's going to happen at the end of the time. I mean, I, I find it really seriously distressing that, um, that, you know, you see after Christmas, you know, two weeks later, the, the communal bin is just full of stuff that people, you know, toys that are already out. I mean, they, they lived for a week and now they're in the bin. I mean, you find, I just find it, and then, there they are, and they're not separated waste or anything like this, and they'll probably just mostly not end up in landfill or incinerated. And I just feel like uh, we should, we shouldn't, you shouldn't really be allowed to sell that kind of thing, if you ask me. <laughs> I, I just feel like either society should insist on it, like we shouldn't buy stuff that you just can't recycle or, or, or won't last, or, or the government should step in, but I I would love it to be society insisting that none of us buy stuff, but it's uh, it's maybe idealistic, um, but but you're absolutely right that uh, but we should there's a, a makerly approach to the world which we're completely lacking, and uh, you know I, I don't want to go down the line that the government went down with citizenship like the UK tried to teach how to be a citizen I think it's kind of that's what culture is like you have to hand it on to your friends and your family that is it's not for schools it's for us all to do <laughs> I think makerliness is the same like we have to just we have to hand it on and make it happen thank you so our, our final question is kind of again comes in two parts um, so one would be one part 
what is your favorite material um i said i was going to ask you this it's also come in from twitter um and also one material that you think is uh sort of is problematic to replace or cycle yeah uh well so i'm always asked my favorite material and it usually turns out to be the material i've just been using <laughs> I, I am sort of hopelessly uh easily fall in love with materials um and I feel I feel like it's like saying, "What's your favorite, um, your favorite child?" You know, like I, 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 not that I feel like I'm responsible for, this, but I feel like, come on, you know, they're all so wonderful, and there are very few materials that I think you can absolutely say that is a material. I mean, look at mercury, right? It's toxic, and it's, you know, in general, uh, bad for everybody. But my God, it's hard not to love that material, isn't it? And I have some of it in my mouth, yeah, you know, in the form of fillings. And it, you know, if it wasn't in there, I would, you know, probably have lost that tooth. And I was talking to a dentist the other day who was saying that even though people are trying to reduce the number of amalgam fillings in the world, they, they, they actually there isn't. In some cases, there is not an alternative materials for that situation because of their mechanical properties. So, you know, even even mercury, which you could point the finger at quite easily, I, I feel it deserves its deserves its status as a, as a great material. Um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, a material that's, that's that's problematic, difficult to replace. Well, actually, mercury is a good example of this. So, <laughs> it turns out that my generation and the people before me uh, had mercury, and that stopped us having toothache, and it's a, it's a fantastic material. It's been slowly replaced in most cases if you, um, by, by polymers, which are UV cured in the mouth. But the people like me who then die, we go to incinerators, right, to be cremated, the mercury levels around the, are getting to, you know, well, they've already exceeded, in fact, regulatory levels because the mercury goes straight out of the incinerator into the local environment of about a, a mile or two. <laughs> so it's a real problem. What, what do you do um, at end of life mercury fillings? And I guess the real way to deal with this is to, is to, is to remove them at death and, and, and put them back in the system and have them put into someone else's mouth. Um, that, that's, that's the... Um, Circular economy way to do it. <laughs> Ultimate circular economy is that all of you is recycled at the end of your life. <laughs> uh, and on that uh, morbid note, I think uh, <laughs> we, we, we're going to have to draw to a close. I, I feel like we're only just scratching the surface of, uh, of kind of the contents of of, uh, of kind of your mind on materials and also your materials briefcase that we can see in the background. Um, but thank you so much for answering so many questions today, Mark. Um, I been told that in the Google Hangouts you can click to a kind of applause and I've been told that it's been it's been rapturous throughout the the, the presentation and, and the questions um, thanks to everyone who's asked your brilliant questions um, online today uh, Dale my colleague has posted a link to the diff cafe where you can continue the conversation we didn't get a chance to answer all the questions um, due to the time but I'd love it if you could carry on some of those discussions in the in the cafe. Just like to mention a couple more events we've got coming up this week on the diff. Uh, we've got two more headliners. Um, we've got Ellen MacArthur speaking from the BSR conference in New York. She'll be discussing uh, the the acceleration accelerating the transition to a circular economy. That's a late one. It's tomorrow night at 10:15 GMT because it's coming from New York. Um, We've also got Ken Robinson uh, on Thursday, 3 to 4 p.m. GMT. We've discussed with Mark today some of the um, amazing things that can happen when you get some interdisciplinary thinking going on. I'm sure that Ken will be, uh, will be covering some of those topics as well in his session on inspiring a generation. Finally, we've got our grand finale um, on, for the diff. It's on the 12th of November from 5 p.m. It's a double header event. Um, so we've got biomimicry from Janine Benyus and Michael Paulin, uh, followed, but, uh, followed up by the new consumer. And we'll be speaking uh, to and hearing from uh, Rachel Botsman and David Rowan, their editor of Wired. So I hope you can join us for some of those events. But once again, Thank you very much for joining us for, for this Disruptive Innovation Festival headline event. And thank you to Mark uh, for that fascinating insight. Thanks.